How's everybody tonight? Blessed and highly flavored. Praise God. Training for reigning. You don't reign unless you're trained. <laughs> God doesn't put someone in a position to reign unless he's trained. That's why they have a certain age where you can buy certain weapons <laughs> in this country. But in the kingdom of God, it's not about an age. It's about being trained. Trained up. And training always takes consistency. Oh, we've heard that word before, haven't we? Because there's no victory without consistency. It's impossible. These are some of the requirements. There's something that the Spirit brought to me in the area that we needed to get it recorded. Because we get questions on certain areas, especially ancestral or generational curses. We're just, it seems like people don't get it sometimes. And they don't realize what they're doing. It's bringing a curse on their life. How many of y'all want to live a blessed life? But then we got to stop, remove all the cursed things that's causing us a cursed life. You know, um, God wants to bless our socks off. Amen? And, and sometimes things that he blesses us with become an idol. And when it becomes an idol, it becomes a curse. That's why anything between you and the Lord, I'm telling you anything, anything, I'm going to say that again, anything, your spouse, your children, your job, anything that is in between you and the Lord becomes a curse. So everybody got it? Why? That's why he said something very powerful. He said, if you really want to follow me, now that you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow but you must hate your life. Your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your wife, your children, your husband. And that word hate means that God must be first in everything. So that means that you must and we all must desire and be willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill his will. Not our own. Amen? To fulfill His will. So whatever it takes, we must be willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill His will. Now, if you don't know what His will is, then it's your responsibility to search it out. It's our responsibility to search out the will of God for our life. So we must, first of all, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all things will be added. What will be added? Well, he's going to begin to unfold his will. But if there's still, let me share something with you. Even a desire can become an idol. Even a desire can become an idol. Because we have a tendency to try to manipulate things to fulfill our desire. And we even put that desire before God. And let me tell you, a desire will speak louder than the voice of God sometimes. Because we're searching the desire out more than we are the Lord out. In Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we've heard this met multiple times. In verse 7 it says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Again, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, he won't be mocked. 
He's not going to be mocked. Whatever you sow, whatever man sows, he will reap. Nobody gets away with just sowing and not reaping. Nobody. Now look at it. It says, for he who sows to his flesh, he will reap, will of the flesh reap what? Corruption is a curse. Has everybody got it? Corruption is a curse. So if, when you sow to the flesh, you reap a curse. But he who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life or life. So there's either life and blessing or curse and death, one or the other. And we're either leaning towards one way or the other. And let me share with you that when you begin to lean in the arena of curse, which promotes death, when you come out of that, the quicker you repent of that, when you come out of that, again, the quicker you repent, the less you reap. The longer it takes for you to repent. So that's what the enemy wants you to do is this. He wants to get you in a place where you sold to the flesh, you're reaping the curse, and he wants you to justify, reason, compromise, and take a long time to come to repentance because he knows that that period of time he has got legally to bring havoc in your life. And he will try to kill you in that period of time. So when we repent for these things, we need to sow. Quickly. Why? Because you want to outrun the reaping do you. So we sow in the spirit more. We sow in the spirit more. We sow in the spirit more. We cry out to the Lord. Seek him with all of your heart and you will find him. You know, people are still trying to, well, where is the Lord? Well, why don't you seek him with all of your heart? Instead of relying on all the other things that bring you fulfillment. And then you will find him. One of the areas the enemy influences, influences us to sow in the flesh is through acts of the flesh and through your mouth. Those are the two areas. Through the acts of your flesh and through your mouth. He tries to get you to sow in the flesh to reap corruption. So that you can bring a curse on yourself. Because in Proverbs 18, 21, you don't have to go there, just write it down. It says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So you have the power of this tongue to bring a curse in yourself or to bring a blessing in life to yourself. You have the power to cut something loose or to bring it on in and reattach yourself to it. And Isaiah 33, would you go there please? Isaiah 33 in verse 5 and 6. It says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Now look at this. It says, wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of your salvation. Wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That's reverence, honor, and respect. It's amazing in how quickly individuals do things and negate the fear of the Lord. Say things like Jesus is not even there. Do acts like Jesus is not even there. Like he's not even there. What a shame. No relationship. 
See, so when a person is in that condition, their relationship is when they want it, but God wants it all the time. So what it, then a person is actually using God, and God can't use them. So everybody got it? Wisdom and knowledge is the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. So we're going to need some wisdom and knowledge with understanding, aren't we? That's why Hosea 4, 6 says what? <laughs> Come on, go there. We want to back. Hosea. Four, six. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. They're destroyed, destroyed, set it on a path of perishing because they have sold to the flesh and brought a curse to themselves. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Because you have rejected my counsel, correction, and direction, my wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I will also reject you from being priest. A priest is someone that's close to the Lord, who ministers to the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, a priest's inheritance was the Lord. That's what his inheritance was, the presence of God. It says, because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. So you see, something happens. There is a ripple effect. When you sow in the flesh and bring a curse, that curse comes to you, and it's rippled effect down your family line. So everybody got it? Destroyed for lack of knowledge. Children forgotten. This is how the sins of the ancestors, the forefathers, come down. This is how we're, you are what you've inherited until somebody breaks it off. Why? Because they sowed in the flesh and they're reaping corruption because they have brought a curse. A curse is a legal right for any demon to access your life. And they flood. They come as quick as possible. They do everything they can to prevent you from coming and humbling yourself and repenting. They do everything they can. They want to keep you in that place of reasoning, justification. Blame this person. Blame that person. Compare yourself with someone else. The longer you take, the more you reap. Psalm 51. That's why the word tells us about forgiveness. Forgive. Forgive. Why? Because without forgiveness, there's bitterness. And that person is walking in the curse. Because that's what bitterness is. It is a curse. And it is a demon. Because he has a legal right to be there. Because that person refuses to repent. Psalm 51. Verse 1. Would you read it with me? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Transgressions are the act. These are the acts, what we call reacts, because of the influence of the presence of evil, which is called sin. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He knew because he reacted, that he sowed in the flesh, he acted according to the presence, the influence of evil, that when that reaction manifested, it was a transgression, he knew it brought a curse on him and his family line. He knew it. He said, for I acknowledge my transgressions, 
No, he says, verse 2, I'm sorry. Wash me thoroughly from my, what? Iniquities. That's an iniquity is an inherited curse. Goes on the family line. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my what? Or my acts. I acknowledge my deeds. And my sin is always before me. In other words, the presence of evil is always still there. Against you only, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth, what? In a curse. I was born with a curse. Why? Because it's called a generational curse or inherited curse. Ancestral curse. They're born with it. How are we born with it? Because of our forefathers that committed transgressions and never repented for them. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother, what? Conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the what? Inward parts. And in the hidden part you will make me to what? No wisdom. Well, wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about something? What's going to be the stability of your salvation in these times? Wisdom and what? Knowledge. Even he was crying for it. Because he knew exactly what was going on. I was born. I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born in sin. Man, I need some wisdom and knowledge and understanding of how to break this off. In Deuteronomy 5. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Herb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire and stood between the Lord and you, and I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, which means bondage. Out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under, or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God and am jealous, God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. He looks at an individual who turns his back on him and says, you hate me. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is like the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any other of your uh, cattle, nor your stranger who is with you within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you are a slave in the land of the world, Egypt. 
And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be what? Long, and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not what? Murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house. His field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly. In the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So again, this was the law of God to bring curse or blessing because they didn't even realize what they were doing. And he began to expose it. Now, um, he said that a curse would come down through the third to fourth generation. So if nobody's repented for that, it repeats itself. So within the third to fourth generation, if nobody's repented for them, it will repeat itself and go to the fifth and sixth and continue and continue and continue all the way through until these things are broke. Now, there are many people, oh, it's a generation, this, that, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But there's a, a time, gen, time sequence for a generation of a nation and a people. Now, we know that the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, right? And he said, this generation will perish. But so all those who went into the wilderness perished except for two. But those that were born in the wilderness stayed alive and came out. Because a generation is counted as 70 years. And Psalm 90 Again, I, I, there's a generation of a people and a generation of a nation. Now, we look at it a generation. So if I was to have uh, my first child would be considered the first generation, my second child would be considered the second generation. This is how we look at it a, 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 in the natural. Does everybody understand? Oh, this Because we, we show up at a family reunion. Oh, here's third and fourth, fifth generation. But a generation is actually 70 years. And Israel, well, we'll talk about that later. I love it. Psalm 90, is everybody there? Psalm 90. Hallelujah. Verse 10. What does it say? The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are what? 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we what? We fly away. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we see here, he even discusses that a generation is approximately 70 years. Now, a person could live 80, and we know that some people live um, m more than 80, depending on how they are. Amen? Leviticus 17. It's amazing, I was doing some research and so forth, and how many, I found it all, how many people think that a generation is 20 or 25 years? How could anybody even think that? Because they're carnal. They need to search the word out and be led by the Spirit, and they're going to find out that a generation is 70 years, not 20 or 25 years. Leviticus 17, is everybody there? Okay, are you ready? Verse 11. Let's read it. For the life of the flesh or the natural body, the physical body, is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So 
the life of your flesh, your physical body, is actually in the blood. So when a curse comes, it affects your blood. That's where the curse comes. Why? Because a curse is the opposite of a blessing, which now a blessing brings life. A curse brings what? Death. So a curse affects the blood. People wonder why they're, they're in the certain conditions sometimes because that curse has been inherited. That's why when you go to a doctor, what does he first do? He takes the blood test or he asks you, hey, is there any diabetes? Is there heart disease? Is there this? What's he looking for? He's looking for disease in the blood, but it's actually a curse that generated. That's how it originally generated. Came in the blood and comes on the family line. And we don't want those to go to our children, do we? Amen. In Deuteronomy 28. Many times you'll, somebody will come for counsel or whatever and we begin to discuss certain things and they have certain bondages and well, does your, who, who else has it in your family? Well, you know, yeah. Yeah, we're the same. We, we carry the same disease. <laughs> well, no kidding. You carry the same demon. Remember, a curse gives a demon a legal right to access you. So not only is the, the blood cursed, but the evil presence is there too. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15. He said, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning, fever, with the sword, with scourging, and with mildew, they shall pursue you until you perish. Now, are these things in the physical realm now? Yes, because of the curses that have been brought into this realm because of the disobedience of the children of God. Now, once a curse, these spirits are brought into this realm, they're in. That's it. They're in. They're in here until we all go. They're here. They have access. Because of the things that we do, bring them in. God's trying to hold them back. And God's people being disobedient in the things that they're doing, bring a demon right from hell into, the net, into this realm. Right here. Then they, they walk amongst the people and they torment them and everything else. That's why you have sickness, diseases, and fevers, and inflammation, and all of this other stuff. Because once they're in, they're in. Everybody got it? Hallelujah. Verse 23. It says, and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze. In other words, bam. No answers. No nothing. Deader than a doornail. And the earth which is under you shall be iron. Iron represents judgment, torment. In other words, the hell beneath will have access to you. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. In other words, there's no victory. 
You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And no one shall frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with what? Tumors. And with the scab. And with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually. And no one shall save you. I don't think we want that, do we? This is the curse from God. Go to, sound, go to uh, verse 58. I'm not going to read all of these. If you do not carefully uh, observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, he'll bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall what? Cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of law will the Lord bring upon you until you are dead. Why? Because the end result is what? Death. So, again, people don't take these things serious. They wonder why all kinds of things are going on in their life. Now, this is under the law. Yes, we are under grace, but we must fulfill the law just as Jesus did. And by you and me fulfilling that requirement is being led by the Spirit. Is everybody okay? Praise God. Why don't we go there for a second so you get an understanding. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Because you know we're going to get, oh, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Well, grace is God's plan. So if you're not doing God's plan, <laughs> you're under the law. <laughs> is everybody there? Romans 8 and verse 1. Would you read it with me? There is therefore now no one condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What's condemnation? That's associated with what? Judgment. That's, that's where a curse comes, doesn't it? So there's no condemnation, there's no curse to those who are in Christ. Now look at the, this. Who do not what? Walk according to the flesh. Why? Because the flesh promotes a curse, which gives a legal right to the devil to access me and you. So you may be proclaiming to be a believer, but you're in the flesh. You're doing the works of the flesh. You're allowing the works of the flesh to manifest in your life. You are cursed. And you are under the law, which you and I cannot fulfill anyways. We can't obey it. Again, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the what? Look at verse 4. Very important. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled where? In us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So how are you released from that law? Walking according to the Spirit. Does everybody get this? This is serious. I, you know, I don't think people really get what's going on sometimes because they lose the fear of the Lord. They just think they can just shoot off at the mouth and do anything anytime they want. And then think they're going to get away with it. And then they walk, walk, walk. And it could be years. And next thing you know, you're just, oh my God, I don't get it. I go to church once every once in a, once in, once in a while. I tithe once in a while. I 
I pray once in a while. I love God. He knows my heart. Oh, you got a devil. You got a big reaping demon that's preventing you from being humble and you're full of pride. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further. So the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be counterly minded is what? Death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So everybody get it? Daniel 9. Oh, hallelujah. Daniel 9, verse 1, would you read it with me? In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherah, of the lineage of the Medes, who, made, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years, which is what? A generation. In the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed and, and, and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteous, all, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belong shame and fit of face. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. So will rebellion bring a curse? Amen. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the what? The curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, a servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us by bringing us bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole earth such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. In other words, they did not come to repentance and turn away from them. They lacked wisdom and knowledge and understanding. They were in captivity. It wasn't until Daniel found the book of Jeremiah that Jeremiah prophesied that they would be in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And, Jer and, and uh, Daniel was wondering why they weren't cut loose yet. So he began to pray to God. And he began to repent for the sins of the nation, the people, and his forefathers, and all their forefathers, that they might be released from the spirit of bondage and the curse that has been brought upon them. Verse 14. 
Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all works which he has does. Though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and from the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are in reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications for the Lord's sake cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our own, of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people who are called by your name. So we see Daniel found out. He humbled himself. And when he, as he began to pray, the Lord sent a servant, uh, an angel to him and said, I got it. Okay, now I'm going to give you more understanding. Does everybody understand this? See, this is where we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Where we not only repent for our stuff, but we repent for the sins of our family, for the sins of our forefathers, and we begin to break this stuff off and command it to go. Why? Because there's life and death in the power of the tongue, isn't there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are called ancestral or inherited or uh, generational curses. Until somebody breaks these, they recycle and repeat. Amen? And the only way that we're going to get out of these is to break and loose them. But then what we got to do is we've got to be careful to maintain being led by the Spirit and not being sucked into the flesh. Amen? That's called a self-imposed curse. Has everybody got it? So we got an ancestral, generational, inherited curse that comes down that you and I are born with. Now, when you and I came to Jesus, we repented for all of our sins. What the curse that was broke off of us was death, hell, and the grave. So we had eternal life, didn't we? Amen? But people still struggle, don't they? They're not free yet. In other words, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door where you can access and get free. But let's accept me and let's get you in here so you can get some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Cooperate with me and I'll set you free. Does everybody get it? See, so many people argue, well, I don't have that curse no more. I repented for my sins and that's what got you in. Amen? That's what got you in the building, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what got you in the tabernacle. Okay, you're repenting. You accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Come on in. Now let's do the rest. <laughs> I, get, I get that argument all the time. Well, no, I repented of my sins. That curse is not me. That is. No, wrong. No understanding. See, that's what religion wants to teach. So it keeps people in bondage and not free. Glory. Galatians chapter 5. Now we got to be concerned about a self-imposed curse. That means what you're doing now will bring it on you. Amen. But again, what you're doing now, what it will bring on you will also go where? To your children. In verse 16 it says, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, if you're walking in the spirit, you are fulfilling the required law, amen, that you're not under the law. You are fulfilling the requirement of not being under the law, but you are under grace. But this grace means that you must cooperate with the will of the Lord, amen. So rebellion will be sowing to the flesh. Amen? 
rejecting counsel of the Lord will be sowing to the flesh. Does everybody get this? Shooting your mouth off as something stupid because you still want to be alive will sow to the flesh and you'll bring a curse. And it's a self-imposed curse again. And the longer you wait to repent, the more you will reap. And you have to reap. You will reap. Something is delayed. You lose something. Something happens. Always. Delay. Okay. Galatians 5, 16, I say then walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish, you desire. Hello? But if you are led by, you are, if you are led by, if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the what? The law. Hallelujah. Why? Because you are fulfilling it. Now the works of the flesh are evident. In other words, you're going to say, look at man. This, if you're doing any of these things, you are not being led by the Spirit. And you have a curse. And where it curses, there's demons. And you are dying again. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are what? Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. What's idolatry? Anything between you and God. Anything between you and doing the will of God. Sorcery, which is also associated with drugs. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions. That's putting self versus and it's not denying self. Dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, and revelries, and anything that's like this that's associated with the works of the flesh, of which I tell you before, and just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, 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 live it, justify it, reason it, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they're cursed. Cursed people don't inherit the kingdom. Amen? Does everybody get it? Cursed individuals cannot get in the kingdom. Hallelujah. So this brings a temporary curse. I mean, a self-imposed curse, doesn't it? So until something's done about it, it increases more and more and more, doesn't it? I'm going to go to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. Self-imposed curse. We know that rebellion will bring in self-imposed curse, right? Trusting in your own strength will bring self-imposed curse. You know, and I'm going to give you a scripture. You can just write it down. It's Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Individuals that curse or reject Israel. Bring a curse. It brings a curse on them. You know, I get a lot of people, oh, I don't need to pray for Israel. I don't care. That person's cursed and doesn't even know it. Those who bless Israel are blessed. Those who curse Israel are cursed. The word tells that we're to pray for Israel every day. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Is everybody there? Read it with me, please. Starting in verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little woo lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. A traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Does everybody see this? So David's anger... Now, Nathan's the prophet telling David the story. 
He's telling about this rich dude and this poor dude and how the rich guy really took advantage of this poor guy. And David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold to the, for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan was, I like that. He said, David, you're the man. I, I can imagine David probably almost passed out. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and you gave and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. He brought a self-imposed curse. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversary against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the what? Enemies. Why? Because he brought a curse, didn't he? And the powers of darkness, the enemies are now have access to him. You have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who was born to you must surely what? Can't have that seed. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And so the elders of his house arose, went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor would he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that he, the child was dead. So they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he could not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead now? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he's dead. Now, I want you to look what David did. Verse 20. And David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and what? Worshipped. Then he went to his own house and he went, when he requested, they sent food before him and he ate. But I think it's pretty powerful in that area that what did he do? Okay, he repented. He went to the house of the Lord. What he did is he went before the Ark of the Covenant and he worshiped the Lord. He accepted his judgment. He accepted what he reaped. He broke the curse for that period, but there was still an inherited curse coming down the family line. From that point on, all of David's sons were murderers and fornicators. And David could not build the house of God, which he so desired to do, was his greatest desire was build a house for the Lord, a tabernacle, a dwelling place for the Lord. And the Lord said, no, because you have blood on your hands. That's why Solomon was the only one that could build it. So David prepared everything and got everything, millions and millions of dollars and pounds of gold and tons and tons of stuff and prepared it all for his son Solomon 
to build it. Does everybody get it? So again, David couldn't build the house of God, brought a curse on his family line. His sons all became murderers and fornicators. Amen. There was no rest to the family. The sword was always there. The child died because it was cursed. Amen. And again, David eventually died and passed on everything to his sons. But he could not. His main desire, most wonderful desire that he wanted to do was build the house of God. And he couldn't. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, there's another in Malachi 3. You don't have to go there in verses 8 and 9. And it says, will a man rob God? Well, you've robbed him from, his tithe, from, your, from the tithes and offering. A tithe is 10% of what your income is, not after your taxes, before your taxes. That's income. Now, if you own a business, your income is not before your expenses. Has everybody got it? Yeah. So in this, a tithe and offerings. He said, you have robbed me from tithes and offerings. Amen. A tithe will maintain an offering will it cause an increase. He said, you are cursed with a curse because you have robbed me. And Psalm 1.1, 1, 1, 1 through 3, you can write this down. And this is where he said, you are cursed because you accepted ungodly counsel. And you've rejected godly counsel. This will bring a self-imposed curse. Abortions bring a self-imposed curse. And Leviticus 20. In verse 22, it says, You shall therefore keep all the statutes of my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all things, and therefore I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. You shall make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird, or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you is unclean and you shall be holy to to me for i the lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine and a man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death they shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them in other words a person that's visiting mediums or doing tarot cards or seeking information through anything else besides the Lord is cursed. It is called a self-imposed curse. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. You know, the devil tries to manipulate with you. You'll run into someone who'll try, who's a new ager or in the all worldly. Hey, what's your sign? <laughs> what's your sign? <laughs> I'm sealed. <laughs> I don't have a sign. <laughs> My sign? Hallelujah. 
I lift my hands to heaven and praise the Lord. Here's my sign. I'm sealed, man. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that we don't love people. Amen? But people got to know. Why? Because the reason why they're in that condition is because they're cursed. Amen? Does everybody get it? Why? Because where a spirit is, there's a curse there. And it says, And such for some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of a God. So what is he saying? He says, Some of you have been in a sodomite, a homosexual. Some of you have been drunkards, fornicators, or dogs. But you've been washed, man. You've been set free. You're no longer that anymore. Now walk in it. Why? Because doing those things will bring a what? Self-imposed curse. Again, a curse is a demon. And where there is a demon, there is a curse. Now we've got what we call a uh, temporary curse. So we understand what a self-imposed curse is. We bring those things on ourselves. Inherited curses. Temporary curse. Remember we talked about the uh, things that are brought into this realm already, like sickness, disease. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, and you don't have to go there, or unless you want to. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, it says, If you come out from among them and don't touch anything unclean, then I'll be a father to you. Amen. So touching things that are unclean can bring a temporary curse. Of course, there are certain things that you can bring a self-imposed curse too. In other words, if you touch, shake somebody's hand that's got a sickness or disease or a flu or virus, that's still a curse. It could be a temporary curse. So if you don't do something about it, amen, break it off, take care of yourself, whatever, it'll kill you. Does everybody get it? You know how many people are, children are dying in other countries because they got a stomach flu and they're dehydrated and there's nobody there to assist them for a simple stomach flu that these kids are withering up and dying left and right. And that's all they would need is an antibiotic or something to kill that flu or virus. Amen? Another thing that will bring a, self, uh, a temporary curse is accursed items. And in Joshua 7, if you'll go there, please. Joshua 7. Accursed items will bring a temporary curse also. Why? Because then once you get rid of them, the curse is gone. Of course, you better repent. For being stupid. Amen? Joshua 7 and verse 7. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over to Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? All oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed. A transgression brings a curse. They have transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and brought for stolen and deceived and they have also put it among their own stuff therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turn their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the what accursed items or remove them amen so that will bring a temporary curse or 
if you promote it and keep it, it will be a self-imposed curse that will maintain for a while. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Generational, self-imposed, and temporary curses. Is everybody okay? Are you getting this? Hallelujah. Second Pete, verse 2, I mean, uh, chapter. Did I say Second Pete? Well, Second Pete. Second Peter. Second Peter, please. Chapter, tw uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yo. Is everybody there yet? Did you get out of Timothy? <laughs> Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 12. But these like... Natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. That's what? Curse. Is everybody with me? Okay. And will receive the wages of unrighteousness of those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. There are spots and blemishes of carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin enticing unstable souls they have a heart trained in covetous practices and are what accursed children accursed children amen how many of all know that we were accursed children at one time praise god but then the lord did what he brought us out of it he brought us out of it you know vows things that things that we haven't repented for and broke off must be done and i want to close it matthew 24 Matthew 24, Jesus was hanging out with his disciples. And in verse 4, and Jesus said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of what? Wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. Why will these things come to pass? Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. Because more demonic influence will be released because of the transgressions of mankind. More demonic, that's why things are getting worse. There's a sense that things are getting better for some people in, in a certain area, but the earth generally is getting worse. More evils taking place. Amen? In verse 32. Now it says something very powerful. It says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, and you know that the summer is near, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, how long is the generation? Seventy years. Will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But as of the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The fig tree is known as Israel. Israel became a nation in 1948. 1948 and 70. Anybody got a number? Hello? So we're between 2000 and what? 17 or 18. 
Amen. Does everybody get it? We're pretty close, aren't we? Now, this is the generation. He says it's got to come in that period. So it can be any moment. Is everybody okay? Listen, the word says that in the latter days, good will be called evil and evil will be called good. And we're seeing it now. It's all over the place. Man, you turn on the TV and I'm telling you what, it's disgusting. It's incredible. Other things that's going on. You know, kids are going to school and getting worse. They're not getting better. It's tough. You're saying kids are a lot of, a lot of the public schools and stuff. Man, let me tell you, it's tough there. Because they're not Christian. And they're going to teach and, and promote evolution. And they're not going to promote God. They're going to promote every other religion there. And they'll promote witchcraft. And, and they're going to promote same sex. They're going to promote early sex without marriage. They're going to promote everything that is ungodly. Amen? That's why our, we must be parents to our children, not just friends. Parents first, then friends. Amen? Praise God. Listen, things are happening. We're to be using the wisdom that God has given us and understanding and continue to be seekers. We're separated unto the Lord. Don't let the enemy draw you in and suck the life out of you. If you do something, repent quickly, get reconciled. Break the curse. Amen? And things that the Holy Spirit starts bringing up to you, you might have made a vow years ago that you never repented for there might have been something that someone, he's bringing things up more and more so that we are free, completely free. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We're honored and blessed. Let this seed be protected by the blood of the lamb and let it grow and bear fruit for your glory. And let the name above all names, Jesus, be glorified in everything we do in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.